This has a bridge between the West and the heart of Asia. Too often, dictators with imperial aspirations have victimized those living in the South Caucasus. From Russian-backed aggression in Abkhazia or South Ossetia to Turkish-supported Azerbaijani aggression against Armenia, their disregard for human life has been clear. In 2020, Azerbaijan's war uprooted close to 100,000 Armenians from their homes in Nagorno-Karabakh. 6,500 people died. Today, Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, the land they know as Artsakh, still face an acute humanitarian crisis, including threats of ethnic cleansing and chronic shortages of water, energy, health care, and food. That's why I've pushed for more humanitarian assistance to help the victims, both in Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, because the U.S. Re humanitarian response has been, in my view, insufficient. So today I want to hear from you about what more we can do uh, and could be helping uh, uh, these affected areas. But incredibly, it's not just that the United States is failing to meet these humanitarian needs. We're still sending security assistance to Azerbaijan. How on earth can the United States justify sending any kind of support, security or otherwise, to a regime in Baku? It's inexcusable. I personally think it's morally repugnant, and it makes a mockery of the Freedom Support Act. Section 907 of this act is meant to ban security assistance to Azerbaijan until Azerbaijan is, quote, taking demonstrable steps to cease all blockades and other offensive uses of force against Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. And yet, the Department of State has waived Section 907 over and over again. It requested 600,000 for fiscal year 22 to provide Azerbaijan with international military education and training, a program meant to, quote, provide a professional military education to countries selected by the Secretary of State. Suffice it to say that I'm strongly opposed to having any aid go to a fighting force known for war crimes and aggression against a neighbor state. And the department greenlit security assistance to the regime in Baku just months before it invaded Armenia in September. Months before a video caught Azerbaijani forces killing unarmed Armenian soldiers in cold blood. Months before reports surfaced of Azerbaijani soldiers sexually assaulting and mutilating an Armenian female soldier. The GAO report I commissioned to get to the bottom of this found both the Department of State and Department of Defense failed to meet statutory reporting requirements to Congress on this issue. I'd like you to explain why. It simply makes no sense to say that the United States assistance and training has not impacted Azerbaijan's military balance with Armenia. So I want you to give us all the details Congress has asked for so we can assess any assistance the U.S. provides to Baku. And finally, I want to be clear. I still have hopes for a lasting peace in the region. I know Secretary Blinken hosted Armenian and Azerbaijani foreign ministers here in Washington last week. I welcome senior-level U.S. Uh, senior US engagement in this region. The lack of attention to the Caucasus over successive administration has only benefited Russia's interests, so I appreciate this new approach. But I hope to hear from you about what more we could be doing for peace in the Caucasus, and specifically following the recent attack on Armenia. I also remain skeptical that authoritarians in Baku, or Moscow, or Turkey for that matter, will agree to let the Armenian people choose their own destiny. And it's not just Armenia, but Georgia as well. This is a nation with so much potential, and yet today we see intimidation of independent media, arrests of opposition leaders, and continued efforts to block the very democratic reforms Georgia needs to advance on its Euro-Atlantic path. The United States must remain engaged to support the democratic development of Georgia during this tenuous period, and I look forward to hearing from the witnesses about these efforts. The people of this region don't want to live under the threat of violence. They don't want autocratic rule imposed on them by the barrel of a gun. No one wants to live that way, not you, not me. 
not the Armenian people, not the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. They deserve to live in peace. They deserve freedom and security. And that means ensuring that a peace deal does not lead to ethnic cleansing for the Armenian people of Nagorno-Karabakh. It means tackling the needs of the humanitarian crisis there. It means holding accountable those who order and carry out the violence who is seen in this region. So I look forward to hearing from you today about where things stand with the administration's efforts to help facilitate a peace process and address these issues. Uh, when Senator Risch arrives, I'll be happy to recognize him for any opening statements. Uh, let us introduce our two witnesses today. Assistant Secretary Karen Donfrey leads the Bureau of Europe uh, and Eurasian Affairs at the Department of State, having previously served as president of the German Marshall Fund, the National Security Council, and the National Intelligence Council. She's no stranger to the committee, and we look forward uh, to hearing from her today. We're also joined by the State Department's Senior Advisor for Caucasus Negotiations, Ambassador Philip Rieker. Ambassador Rieker serves as the U.S. OSCE Minsk Group Co-Chair and Lead Negotiator for the U.S. Delegation to the Geneva International Discussions. He previously served at the U.S. Embassy in London as Acting Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs and a Civilian Deputy and Policy Advisor to the Commander of UCOM. Welcome to both of you. Your full statements will be included in the record without objection. I'd ask you to summarize them in about five minutes or so so that members of the committee can have a conversation with you. And we'll recognize uh, Assistant Secretary Don Fried first. Chairman Menendez, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to discuss the administration's priorities and engagement efforts in the South Caucasus. I appreciate and welcome your advice as we work collaboratively to advance U.S. interests across the region. Armenia and Azerbaijan have an historic opportunity to secure a lasting peace to a conflict that was triggered during the fall of the Soviet Union and has lasted for more than 30 years. There have been setbacks, such as the fighting that broke out September 13-14. When hostilities erupted, we immediately engaged to halt the fighting. This setback reminded all of us of the fragility of the situation and the importance of securing a comprehensive, sustainable peace agreement. Secretary Blinken's leadership has been instrumental in promoting dialogue. He hosted joint meetings of the foreign ministers on September 19 and November 7, along with a telephone call with both on October 4. National Security Advisor Jake Solomon met with his counterparts in Washington on September 27, demonstrating the administration's whole-of-government commitment to securing peace. Thanks in part to our engagement, on October 4, Azerbaijan released 17 Armenian POWs detained during the September fighting. Actions like this help build needed trust between the two sides, and we take every opportunity to urge Azerbaijan to release the remaining detainees in its custody. We continue to encourage Azerbaijan and Armenia to maintain momentum for negotiations, and we are doing so in close coordination with the EU and other partners. In this vein, we assess the Turkish-Armenian normalization dialogue positively and have let both sides know that we want to play a helpful role. It has the potential to increase regional stability, deter malign influence, and lead to greater economic development. This is even more important now, given Russia's unprovoked brutal war in Ukraine. More broadly, supporting peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan is both the right thing to do and in our national security interest. Should Azerbaijan and Armenia secure a peace deal, our security cooperation will become even more critical as we build the confidence and capacity of each country to freely express their sovereignty in a matter that maintains peace with their neighbors. Our bilateral relations with Armenia have never been stronger. We continue to seek ways to broaden our security partnership, deepen people-to-people -people ties, and grow our cooperation on democratic and economic development. The U.S.-Armenia Strategic Dialogue is the flagship format for this partnership. We held the dialogue's capstone event in Washington in May of this year, including a very positive meeting between Secretary Blinken and Foreign Minister Mirzoyan. 
At that time, we signed a nuclear cooperation memorandum of understanding that can advance Armenia's energy sovereignty and build stronger U.S.-Armenian cooperation on nuclear energy, including through the potential provision of U.S. origin small modular reactors. Other working groups on security and defense, justice reform and democracy discussed additional ways the United States can help bolster Armenia's democratic development. I look forward to participating in the upcoming dialogue in Yerevan next year. In Azerbaijan, we remain committed to advancing our bilateral priorities, security, economic growth, democracy, and human rights. After 9-11, Azerbaijan stepped up early with financial and troop support to Afghanistan and helped protect Kabul International Airport until the final days of the 2021 withdrawal. Security cooperation with Azerbaijan supports our national security priorities, including counterterrorism objectives, interdiction of drugs and illicit material, and increased security of critical Caspian energy infrastructure. We welcome Azerbaijan's growing support for European energy security. The human rights situation in Azerbaijan remains a challenge. This administration regularly urges Azerbaijan's government to respect human rights and the fundamental freedoms necessary to realize the full potential of Azerbaijan's people. In Georgia, the American people have long stood in solidarity with Georgians' desire to be a free, democratic, and sovereign country within its internationally recognized borders. Over the last 30 years, we have become strategic partners working toward a shared vision of a Georgia fully integrated into the Euro-Atlantic family of nations. The United States has allocated over $6 billion in assistance funds to Georgia, sending thousands of Georgians to the United States for cultural and educational exchanges and training tens of thousands of Georgian soldiers to defend Georgia's territory and promote peace and stability outside its borders as well. That assistance supports democratic governance, rule of law, a vibrant civil society, and economic growth. We continue to urge the Georgian government to implement the necessary reforms to acquire EU candidate status. People across the South Caucasus deserve to live in peace, which will unlock prosperity for the entire region. This administration is fully committed to supporting that worthy goal. Thank you again for the opportunity to discuss our priorities and efforts in the South Caucasus. I look forward to your questions. Ambassador Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee. I really do thank you for the opportunity to come before you as the senior advisor for Caucasus negotiations, the opportunity to discuss the administration's efforts to support regional negotiations and address the core issues that pose a challenge to sustainable peace in the South Caucasus. Having taken this position just uh, under three months ago after my return from Embassy London, I very much welcome your interest and value the cooperation with this committee and all members of Congress to advance U.S. interests in the region and help build a lasting comprehensive peace that will benefit the people of the region. Let me start by echoing Assistant Secretary Donfried's optimism about the potential for peace between Azerbaijan and Armenia and her realism about the setbacks we have encountered even since I began the, this, uh, this work. I was in the region, in fact, during the September 13-14 fighting and met with President Aliyev on September 14th to urge an end to the violence. My meetings with Armenian and Azerbaijani leaders paralleled urgent and around-the-clock engagements with leadership of the two countries by Secretary Blinken, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, Assistant Secretary Donfried herself, and Deputy Assistant Secretary Erica Olson, as well as by our colleagues at the Department of Defense. Those engagements have continued since, and the joint efforts of the United States, the European Union, and partner countries have paved the way for a series of meetings between Armenian and Azerbaijani leaders to discuss peace. Despite hostilities, we are encouraged by the pace of engagement by the Armenian and Azerbaijani leadership in their peace process. The leaders have met for negotiations on multiple occasions in recent months as part of an EU-facilitated peace process, most recently in Prague on October 6th. The Prague meeting produced two meaningful outcomes that have the potential to pave the way for peace. Mutual recognition of the 1991 Almaty Declaration as a basis for border discussions and acceptance of an EU monitoring capacity with the potential to build confidence between the sides and de-escalate potential hostilities. 
The United States is engaged bilaterally through partners like the European Union and its peace process and through international organizations like the OSCE. On September 27th, I think you're aware, national security advisors met in Washington to discuss ways of focusing the various tracks of negotiations and accelerating their efforts. On October 2nd, I conferred with the Armenian and Azerbaijani foreign ministers before and after their meeting in Geneva on the margins of the Geneva international discussions about Georgia uh, to encourage their discussions and their accelerated negotiations. And as noted just last week, on November 7th, Secretary Blinken hosted both foreign ministers here in Washington at Blair House to maintain positive momentum between the sides. Our efforts and support and complement those of the EU, which hosted border discussions on November 3rd in Brussels. Now, as with any peace negotiations, as I know you all know well, these are difficult discussions that focus on issues complicated by layers of history. But the pace and depth of the current discussions demonstrates a clear potential, one we haven't seen for a long time, for a settlement that could end decades of conflict. Of course, much remains to be done by both governments, including investigating allegations of human rights and international humanitarian law violations, holding perpetrators accountable, ceasing inflammatory rhetoric, and fostering reconciliation. Though the US and EU are facilitating negotiations between the sides, the substance of these discussions is being led by Armenian and Azerbaijani representatives themselves. Direct negotiations held at the initiative of the two countries and driven by their interests rather than the interests of outside actors have the greatest chance of long-term success. We will support those efforts in any way we can. Secretary Blinken has offered not only his counsel but he has also offered U.S. technical assistance on issues ranging from border delimitation to the planning of transportation routes. While the resolution of contentious issues remains the responsibility of Armenia and Azerbaijan, I've made it clear the international community and the United States has a specific responsibility to ensure that the rights and security of ethnic Armenians are addressed credibly and in line with a peace settlement. To that end, I've repeatedly encouraged the leaders in both countries to consider an international mechanism or construct to ensure, monitor, and report on any agreement involving Nagorno-Karabakh. The sides are at an historic crossroads. We're encouraging them to choose a future of prosperity and demonstrate the wisdom of working together on a peace that will benefit the people of the region for generations to come. Our efforts will continue toward this goal and we'll do so in any way we can. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Well, uh, thank you. We'll start around. I have to be honest with you. This testimony is unresponsive to the concerns that I've raised, either in my opening statement or in the past. So let me try to get responses to it through questions. Uh, in 2020, Azerbaijan's war rooted close to 100,000 Armenians. Is that true? Yes. Um, and 6,500 people died. Is that true? I believe that's, that's the numbers I've seen, although I don't know that there are exact counts, Senator. Uh, have you seen the video that caught Azerbaijani forces killing unarmed Armenian soldiers in cold blood? I've seen a number of videos. Uh, my email box is filled have, with them. Have regular. you been able to verify the videos? I have not, no. Are we making efforts to verify the videos? I'd have to check with, with others. I know in the uh, region they were take, undertaking efforts in how about both the countries. How about the reports of Azerbaijani soldiers sexually assaulting and mutilating an Armenian female soldier? I think we've all seen those reports, many reports of atrocities. Well, this is the problem. Uh, I don't understand, um, my understanding also, are you familiar with reports of Azerbaijan's reported use of illegal weapons, including white phosphorus cluster bombs, both of which are internationally prohibited munitions? I am not as familiar with those specific reports. Well, the white phosphorus is very well reported, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately provided by Ukraine. Uh, so here's my point. You all seem to be looking the other way because of whatever interest we have with Azerbaijan. Uh, you mentioned, Assistant Secretary, there's some security interests, some drug trafficking interests. 
But that should not trump, at the end of the day, violations that go to the very core of the instability. My frustration with the State Department is that they always say, well, well both sides should refrain. I, but when there is an aggressor, we should call out the aggressor. And I think it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out who is the aggressor, who has the ability to even be an aggressor in this conflict. It's Azerbaijan. Yet we look the other way and we waive Section 907. How does the administration uh, answer the GAO study that clearly said that the State Department did not meet up to its responsibilities uh, in determining whether such a waiver should take place? And how do you provide a waiver in the face of all of these uh, atrocities being committed by Azerbaijan? Assistant Secretary Dontry. Chairman Menendez, to your first point about the State Department looking the other way, we are working very hard to achieve a goal I think we share, which is a sustainable peace in the South Caucasus. As I noted in my opening testimony, we have seen over three decades of conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And what we are hearing from both of those countries today is they both believe there is an historic opportunity for a sustainable peace in the region. That would be profoundly important for both of these countries and for the region as a whole. And what we are trying to do is facilitate to the best of our abilities these two countries achieving that peace. And I'm happy to go into detail about how we're doing that. So facilitating, that, including uh, just overlooking what Azerbaijan does. Now, let, let's come to your concern about our waiving 907. We welcome the GAO's review of the Section 907 waiver process, and we took steps to implement the GAO's recommendations before making the decision to extend the waiver in June. I want to emphasize there is nothing automatic about either the waiver or about any subsequent... It looks pretty automatic to me. In the, in the face of all of the facts, how does one justify a 907 waiver? You know, is it humanly possible to say that Azerbaijan has not benefited itself from the assistance we have given it in a way that gives it a clear edge against Armenia as it relates to its military prowess. There's no way to say that. You can't sit here with a straight face and say that. We have looked at this with great care. We have asked all engaged in these programs whether they assess that there is an impact on the negotiations between Armenia and Azerbaijan, whether there is an assessment that U.S. assistance in some way undermines or hampers efforts to achieve a peaceful settlement between Azerbaijan and Armenia, and to assure that any assistance we provide cannot be used for offensive purposes against our I, I, You know, I have a great deal of respect for you, but you're losing my confidence when you make remarks like that. What specific actions, I'll close on this, has the Biden administration taken to directly help at-risk Armenians living in Nagorno-Karabakh? And I want you to cite for me program descriptions, partner organizations, deliverables, budgets, other relevant details, because I, I think we are woefully underserving the humanitarian needs of those who are facing the realities of this conflict. I, I will turn that question to Ambassador Reeker, but I do on 907 want to be very clear that I do believe that assistance is in the national security interest of the U.S. So we provide non-lethal border security that has provided significant results countering transnational threats from Iran and disrupting smuggling routes to the South Caucasus, Russia, and Europe. So I do believe what that assistance is going to supports U.S. Border government. security that allows Azerbaijan to actually infringe upon the actual borders of Armenia. Uh, can you tell me what actions we're taking to help uh, humanitarian assistance? 
Mr. Chairman, uh, in my context, uh, focusing on this peace process, uh, what is most noticeable is, is the terrible humanitarian uh, toll, uh, particularly from the conflict in, in 2020. And that still seems to be uh, a challenge for many. Um, the department continues to work with relevant agencies to evaluate needs in the region uh, and identify how best uh, humanitarian assistance can be provided. It's important to note that in the Garden of Karabakh itself, access is extremely limited. I have not been able to visit there uh, on my trips uh, in the past two months to the region. Um, it is not currently possible for U.S. government personnel to access the area and conduct needs assessments or, or monitor programs. But the United States has programmed substantial funding for humanitarian demining operations, something that uh, Armenians have raised with us uh, repeatedly uh, as a great concern, as well as Azerbaijanis who have lost a number of civilians uh, to landmine uh, injuries and, and deaths. Um, that includes uh, an announcement, I just have a note here, uh, of $2 million uh, announced on September 11th for that. Uh, I have met, when I've been in the region, with the ICRC representatives and UNHCR representatives uh, based in Yerevan, uh, who are able to travel in, uh, and uh, working with both of our embassies uh, in the region, uh, including also our embassy uh, in Tbilisi, which has uh, access uh, on, on that area. The department does continue to develop programs to strengthen and, and uh, advance ties with peoples in the region to foster the conditions. The goal, of course, of, of my work and what the Secretary and the Assistant Secretary have asked me to do is focus on getting the sides to a peace agreement and they're at this historical moment where perhaps they can do that and prevent any more horrific scenes any more suffering. Well, I, ap I appreciate generation. all the aspirations, but this is total, wholly unresponsive in terms of health care, food security, water. Uh, I can't believe we don't have an answer. Senator Cardin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank both of our, our witnesses. Uh, I have the honor of being the chair of the U.S. Helsinki Commission, which is, of course, monitors our participation in the OSCE. So, uh, Ambassador Riker, I want to ask you a question. I I've been uh, listening to reports for 30 years on the Mintz Group at OSCE international meetings, and it's a carbon copy report every year. Uh, it's 30 years plus. Is it time to end the Mintz Group? Thanks, Senator Cardin. You and I have discussed the Mintz Group and, and OSCE. Um, you're probably familiar with my great respect for the OSCE and, and uh, the what I call toolbox that it offers to the broad region and its 57 participating states. Uh, as you note, the Minsk Group was created under a mandate by OSCE almost 30 years ago after the horrific wars of the 90s and the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, the United States is a co-chair, one of three with France and now, Russia. I, I know the that. background on all this. I'm, my point is that Russia can't really participate now because they're not even participating in the OSCE. It, right. Some of their members can't even get to meetings because of uh, the war in Ukraine. Does this give us an opportunity just to end this process through our leadership in the OSCE? Well, I think uh, that's we, we've seen an evolution, and that's what I've I've taken on board uh, very much. Uh, I've met at the OSCE. Uh, the Minsk Group, as it's been known, is is not functioning. Uh, the mandate remains. The goal of the mandate, uh, of course, remains, and OSCE operates by consensus. I keep in very close touch with uh, the French colleague with the EU, which is so involved in the region now, with other interested parties, the OSC itself. Azerbaijan has simply said they will not deal with the Minsk group anymore. Yeah, I, I'm not suggesting that we not stay engaged with OSCE and the peace process, uh, p uh, potential peace process, but is it time to end the, the Minsk group? As I said, I think it's evolved uh, to the point where, by consensus, we could end that mandate, but I think the mandate itself is quite useful the Minsk Group co-chair process itself is really no longer functioning, and we're, we're participating with the parties themselves on their peace process. I just think it gives cover to Russia right now, and it gives cover to those who don't want to move forward with peace. It's time, I think, for, the, for us to look at a, an effective way. Uh, uh, Secretary Donfried, I want to get to Georgia. Georgia's a strategic partner for the United States. I recognize that. We've seen 
incredible backsliding on democratic uh, advancements, so much so that EU differentiated between Ukraine and Moldova uh, when it came uh, to Georgia, which was a clear indication that EU sees the backsliding. We saw the criticism of our ambassador. Uh, we've seen the failure for judicial reform. So what is our strategy in regards to Georgia advancing democratic institutions, uh, and how do we plan to make progress? Thanks so much for bringing Georgia into the conversation. As you know, the United States has partnered closely with Georgia since its independence from the Soviet Union in 1991. And I think we have seen over those decades significant progress in Georgia in developing its Euro-Atlantic ties. But have we seen progress recently? And, and so we, based on that progress, we have had a strategic partnership with Georgia. And what we've seen recently has been deeply concerning to us because we've seen democratic backsliding in Georgia. And I will tell you, I was in Georgia on the day that the European Commission previewed the decision that was coming from the European Council the next week, where Georgia would be given a European perspective, and as you noted, Ukraine and Moldova were given candidate status. And it was so emotional in Georgia. Uh, I had a lunch with civil society actors who were in tears, because Georgia, as you know, had been the front runner on this path to EU membership. And what strikes me about Georgia is 85% of Georgians support these Euro-Atlantic aspirations. And I think that puts pressure on the government. And what we've been doing is saying to the Georgian government, we have joined hands with the European Union. The list of reforms they are saying you need to make to get candidate status, we are all in on helping you make those reforms. And so we are still hopeful that there will be progress but absolutely we're concerned about the lack of progress to date. And you mentioned the uh, just outrageous criticism of our ambassador to Georgia, Kelly Degnan. And I want to say to the members here that she is a fantastic representative of the United States and Georgia. And I will back her up any day of the week. We have talked to the Georgian government about this. The prime minister has spoken to this. And while these are groups that are not part of the government, some of the groups who have been highly and wrongly critical of her have close ties to the government. Uh, and I, we have made clear that that criticism will undermine the partnership we have had over time. With and I agree with that. I, I would just underscore this point. Georgia is important to the United States, but the United States is critical to Georgia. And we need to make that clear in demonstrable progress towards these democratic goals we need uh, Georgia to be on a path to integration in Europe, and we have to make that absolutely abundantly clear that it's very critically important for the continued support from the United States. If I can just add, I think it's important to just remind all of us that Russia continues to occupy 20% of Georgian territory and seeks to negatively impact Georgia's independence, its ties with the U.S., and its democracy. So I do believe, as you just said, that our continued engagement and support is critical for Georgia's future and for the South Caucasus. Thanks. Thank you. Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to ask some questions about food security uh, issues. Um, on October 29, Vladimir Putin announced that Russia's suspension of its participation in the UN and Turkey brokered grain deal and he cited the Ukrainian drone attacks against Russian vessels in Russian-occupied Crimea. They agreed to resume participation on November 2, but that agreement is slated to expire on the 19th of November. Um, I don't buy Putin's explanation for the withdrawing from the agreement in the first place because the Ukrainian drone attacks were on their own sovereign territory, which continues to be illegally occupied by Russia. Next week, Ukraine uh, and the world observes the 90th anniversary of the Holodomor, uh, a man-made famine caused by the Soviet Union that killed millions of Ukrainians in the 1930s. Senator Portman, I have a resolution currently under consideration by the SFRC to commemorate this event. So as important as this grain deal is, we can't forget that it's a workaround to a crisis that Vladimir Putin created. 
Secretary Donfried, what's your assessment on prospects, on prospects to extend the grain deal past November 19? Senator Kane, thank you so much for your engagement on Ukraine and the related issues, including food security. We are deeply engaged in the ongoing negotiations to extend the grain agreement. We are cautiously optimistic, but you know we, we will see how this plays out in the end. As you noted, food insecurity is such a critical issue for so many countries around the world. And part of Ukraine's success in standing up to Russia and winning this war is keeping global opinion on Ukraine's side. We've seen how important that's been. Look at the most recent vote on Russia's illegal annexation of Ukrainian territory, where 103 countries stood with Ukraine. So I couldn't agree with you more about how critical this issue is. What we are seeing is continued Russian escalation. Yesterday, we saw the largest number of Russian missiles flying against Ukrainian cities that we've seen in this eight and a half month course of the war. So I think we want to continue to underscore that food insecurity, all of the negative ramifications of this war are a result of Russia's unprovoked invasion. And there's one person who can change that, and it is Vladimir Putin. Putin is the one that can change it, but the U.S. can also play an important role in rebutting misinformation from the Russians. The Russians are indicating the U.S. sanctions are hindering its ability to export Russian grains and fertilizers. That's not the case. That's not what our sanctions do, and there have actually been exports of both grain and fertilizer from Russia. What steps is state taking to counter Russian disinformation that is, you know, apparently convincing some nations in Africa and elsewhere that you know, it's, it's the U.S. sanctions that are causing this food crisis rather than Russian misbehavior. You're absolutely right that Russian misinformation has been quite successful in wide swaths of the world. And we are doing our very best to rebut that through various mechanisms that state is using. We're also working very closely with our allies and partners on this. We are engaging actively with the African Union in various international fora. And we're also encouraging the Ukrainians to engage directly with those countries to share the truth. And I think, I'll point again to that UNGA vote, I think we are having some success with this, but we need to do more because you see the number of countries that also abstained in that vote. So we certainly don't think we've achieved success here. We need to keep engaging on your point that sanctions are not the cause of this. In fact, there are exemptions for food and fertilizer. And we also need to make clear that the United States is the largest provider of assistance to the World Food Program, that we are actively working to get grain to these countries. And I think given Russia's seeming hesitation to renew the Black Sea Grain Initiative, another indicator that Russia's top concern is not alleviating food insecurity around the world. Um, well, I, I hope we'll use the Holodomor commemoration as an opportunity to really cast a spotlight on this. Essentially, it's a, it's a forced hunger issue that's being driven by Russia in the same way that the Soviet Union's manufactured a, a famine in Ukraine that killed millions in the 1930s. One last question, Secretary Donfried. I understand you recently traveled to Ukraine. Um, tell me about the morale of our Ukrainian partners, but in particularly the morale of our personnel at Embassy Kiev. Thank you so much for asking about my recent trip. I was the first government official who is not at the U.S. Embassy in Kyiv who was able to stay overnight in Kyiv, which meant I had two full days, which may not sound like that much, but it did give me the opportunity to meet with a much larger group of Ukrainian interlocutors, but also to spend more time with my colleagues mm -hmm. at the embassy. In terms of the engagements with Ukrainian uh, folks in government, civil society, others, I just came away so inspired. This is a country that is truly under attack. And there are so many things that distract us from what's happening in Ukraine. But we shouldn't be distracted from these unbelievably horrific attacks against the civilian energy infrastructure. And what... Russia is not able to achieve on the battlefield. It is trying to achieve by plunging Ukraine into cold and darkness this winter. And 
the resilience of Ukrainians, but also the pluckiness. You know, the foreign minister said to me, well, I've been taking cold showers, but I hear it's good for my skin. And the, the, their resilience in the face of this, and it's because of the rightness of their cause. And I was there to deliver President Biden's message that we are standing with you. You have our support across every sector from military, economic, humanitarian governance, and we will stay with you until you prevail in this conflict. The uh, embassy morale at the embassy, mm -hmm. also very strong, but boy, do I and all of us at the State Department owe a debt of gratitude to our colleagues who are there every day representing us so ably. Thank you so much, Thank Mr. You. Chairman, over my time, but I appreciate your patience. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Assistant Sec Secretary Don Fried and Ambassador Reeker, thank you both for being here and for all of your efforts, and thank you for that trip to Ukraine, um, Secretary Domfried. I also want to begin by thanking you and all of those at the State Department for your efforts to get the U4 mandate reauthorized at the UN um, for Bosnia. I know that that was a, a real effort, and um, I was very pleased, as those of us who care about the Balkans were, to see that that was done um, and that Russia actually was willing to engage on that. So thank you very much for that. Um, I want to follow up on Senator Cardin's questions about Georgia because I, I appreciate that Georgia is trying to play a positive role in Nagorno-Karabakh. But um, the reality, as you point out, is that there has been tremendous backsliding in Georgia. Um, and we provide considerable support to Georgia to support a reform agenda. Um, I, for one, argue that maybe we should tie some of that aid to behavior on the part of Georgia. And I was persuaded by State Department officials and House members um, in the last round of budget negotiations that maybe that was not a good thing to do. But I think maybe it's we need to think about whether it's time to rethink our strategy on Georgia. So can you respond to that? And um. well, first, Let me begin by thanking you for all you've done in the Western Balkans. And you and colleagues, and there was broad bipartisan support for an extension of that U4 mandate. So I really think it was a shared success. And we have a lot of challenges still in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but to have that continued security presence, absolutely share the view of how critical it was. Um, on Georgia, there too, uh, there's been broad bipartisan engagement on the Hill in Georgia that I think makes an important difference. I think it is always a good thing to assess policy. Uh, so very open to having that conversation in greater detail with you. Um, you know the reasons why we wanted to stay the course at this point in time. We have voiced our strong concerns about some of the troubling statements and behaviors that we are seeing from some Georgian politicians. Um, as I noted, I don't think those are indicative of the majority of Georgian people. And so we I, are... I, I, I don't want to interrupt. Yeah, no, um, go ahead. But I certainly agree with you on that. But the fact is that the current Georgian government said that candidate status was a key commitment that it was going to make. It said that to the public, Georgia. It said that to the United States and to the European community. And they clearly have reneged on that commitment. And I think it's important for us to think about the options that we have to try and hold them accountable for that to let them know that there are consequences. And some of those consequences may be the kind of assistance that we're willing to provide. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I totally agree that the Georgian people are not the ones at fault here. It's their government. But at some point, they need to demand from their government um, more accountability. So I, I will just, I'm going to, I want to switch to another topic, but I, I will leave it at that, and, and I hope that we might be able to engage in the future in a longer discussion about that, because I do think we, we have to think of other ways in which we can help incentivize behavior, because what we're doing now doesn't seem to be working. Mm -hmm. um, on the Black Sea region writ large, um, as I'm sure you're aware, Senator Romney and I introduced legislation um, uh, 
to try and encourage the development of a strategy for the Black Sea region. I think one of the things we've seen from the war in Ukraine is just how important that whole region is and how having a coordinated um, strategy toward the region is really important. And I wonder if you can um, share with us what the department is thinking, whether you have that kind of a strategy, whether you're looking to develop something more, and what you're thinking about in terms of our approach. Well, thank you for that question. Thank you for your work on this as well. There is no question that Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine has focused all of us on the Black Sea region and thinking about the way forward there. Of course, NATO has taken very seriously the threat posed by Russia to our allies that border the Black Sea. And of course, US force posture in the region looks very different today than it did before February 24. So I think there's no question that the way we're thinking about the region and we're thinking about the critical importance of US engagement is different than it was before this war. I will say right now our focus is on ensuring Ukraine prevails in this war because in many ways that is going to be foundational for how we think about Black Sea strategy, but very much welcome your work and your ideas on this, and I can assure you that it is something we are very focused on. So thank you. So just to follow up, um, is there an effort to develop a more comprehensive strategy, and if so, do you have any timetable in mind for when you, I appreciate that item number one has to be the war in Ukraine, but what else are, are we doing and what's the time frame? We are focused on it. I do not have a time frame for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good to see uh, you both. Um, I wanted to ask a, a broad question about Turkey's role in the region. Um, obviously, we know their uh, historic role backing Azerbaijan. There doesn't appear to be evidence that they explicitly supported Azerbaijan's latest uh, provocations, but they have also begun an interesting dialogue with Armenia um, that could ultimately be very important with Russia's preoccupation uh, in Ukraine, Turkey obviously has a vacuum that they can fill. Um, they've been more active than ever since 2020. Uh, talk a little bit, if you would, um, Secretary Donfried, about uh, Turkey's role in the region and you know, specifically uh, on this question of Turkey-Armenia normalization. What's the role that the United States can play to facilitate that? Are we best to just sit back and watch? Is there some kind of active role that we can play? Well, thanks a lot for that question, Senator Murphy. And, and you're right to have us think about the other actors in the region, and Turkey is a critical one. Um, you're right to remark on the close relationship between Turkey and Azerbaijan, but I also appreciate your focus on Turkey-Armenia relations. We very much support normalization between Armenia and Turkey, and we have spoken at length with the Turks about this, and I do believe there is a deep Turkish commitment to move forward on this, which also augurs well for broader peace in the region. And what we've seen is both Turkey and Armenia have appointed special envoys for normalization, and they've met multiple times. They have agreed on initial confidence-building measures. We are encouraging both sides to move forward on those. They're, they need to implement the measures that they've agreed to. So our role here is one of encouraging that, and we are hopeful that we will see progress, because I do think it is part of the puzzle of the South Caucasus about how you get to a sustainable peace in the region. Um, let me just ask a question. I'm sorry if it's been covered already. Obviously, the, the backdrop to our relationship with Azerbaijan is their um, increasing role as a supplier of energy um, to neighbors and into Europe. Um, I have often thought that we have 
gotten the balance wrong when it comes to promoting human rights and democracy in countries that have large oil reservoirs. But uh, this is a country that now has more pipeline capacity than it did 10 or 20 years ago. Um, what's the sort of future of uh, Azerbaijani energy um, with respect to diversifying away from Russian energy in and around the region? And how does this factor into the decisions that we make about how to approach some of these thornier issues uh, of Azerbaijani conduct in the region? So the energy picture in Europe, as we've all seen over the past eight and a half months, has changed fundamentally. The United States, for a long time, has been arguing that Russia is not a reliable supplier of energy for Europe. Not all of our European allies and partners agreed with that assessment prior to February 24. I would say all of them today agree with that assessment. We have long been a voice promoting energy diversification, and we're seeing all of these countries that were overly dependent on Russia looking for other sources. And in that context, Azerbaijan is playing a very important role, and I think will continue to play a very important role. That said, it doesn't mean that we turn a blind eye to our concerns about human rights in Azerbaijan. And I said it in my opening statement, I'll say it again, we regularly urge Azerbaijan's government to respect human rights and the fundamental freedoms necessary to realize the full potential of Azerbaijan's people. I believe it is in our national security interest for us to be promoting human rights and democracy in Azerbaijan, and we will continue to do so. Thanks. Um, thank you for, for that. I won't ask a, a question, or I'm running out of time, but I'll just note, um, I just left this committee meeting to meet with the relatively new leader of uh, one of the opposition parties in Kosovo, uh, who's in town, who I think uh, maybe got the chance to uh, see um, uh, Deputy Secretary Escobar. Um, on the other side of the Black Sea are the Balkan region. We've got um, some real potential bumps in the road coming up with the implementation of the license plate, um, uh, the, the, the license plate agreement in Kosovo. Um, again, I would just urge the department to um, play as active a role as possible in the continued discussions between Serbia and Kosovo. We have, for a long time, for good reason, have relied on the Europeans to take the lead, to the Germans specifically. Um, uh, I think that there is more reason now than ever for the United States to step in. Um, I don't think you'll see uh, as active or as effective um, diplomacy from Europe, uh, and the need has never been greater given what could happen in the coming months uh, in the Serb regions uh, of Kosovo. So um, again, just a plea to maintain uh, real direct involvement from the State Department in uh, those uh, very tricky negotiations and, and talks. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Van Hollen. I do not believe we have said that. Do we have a different assessment? I think all of these things are complicated. And our focus has been on how do we try to move these two countries to a peace agreement after 30 years of conflict. I guess my question, I understand. But we, we did have a, we did see a response to an Armenian attack on Azerbaijan? 
my response to that would be that at that time in September, when we spoke to both parties, our focus was on stopping the violence. I do think we played an important role in that violence being stopped, and our goal is to continue to encourage both sides to negotiate a sustainable peace. Well, that, I mean, with all respect, um, that, that did not respond to the question, but we will follow up uh, with, uh, with respect to the situation uh, there. So has, has Azerbaijan suffered any consequences in terms of US policy as a result of the attack? So Again, what, what we are focused here is on, first let me just say I agree with you about the importance of the speech that Armenian Prime Minister Pashinyan gave in April. I think it was a very brave speech, and I think it, it was very important in encouraging the peace process. We are in very close touch with both sides, and as I said in my testimony, I think our relationship with Armenia is probably better than it's ever been. And we are taking our cues from the parties about how we can be most helpful in moving this peace process forward. There are many elements of it. There is a peace treaty that the foreign ministers are leading on. The Armenian prime minister's speech in April was so important because it related to the future of Nagorno-Karabakh. And what he was saying is putting a focus on the rights and security of the local Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. Yeah, I, I, I recognize that. I thought it was an important speech. Yeah, too. and then we've got... Senator, I'm glad you asked because it's what I try to determine almost every day as I engage on this uh, with Assistant Secretary Donfried's uh, help and guidance. And of course, Secretary Blinken has played an incredible role. He just spoke with both leaders over the last two days, even as he's traveling uh, in Asia, to follow up on the engagements last week. Now, what was very interesting about uh, the engagements of the foreign ministers last week, which were bilateral engagements that we hosted and facilitated at Blair House to underscore for them our willingness, our desire to provide whatever we can in terms of assistance for them to make their project on their peace agreement, was that at the end of the day, they came out with a joint statement, which was the first time they had done it. Now, that may not sound like a lot from State Department people who put out statements all the time, uh, but this was a remarkable thing, and the two leaders, the two foreign ministers, left and left their, their press guys, as it were, to work it out. They did it in just 40 minutes, uh, which was, again, remarkable. I had heard of a, an effort to put out a statement um, after the uh, border uh, commission meeting in, in Brussels the previous week that took three and a half hours. So there's a little bit of progress there. There is broad agreement uh, coming out of that historic speech of, of Prime Minister Pashinyan's, which really I called a, a profile in courage. Um, to look at this in a, a new way. Uh, they've agreed on five broad principles toward a peace agreement. Uh, the Armenians want to include a sixth principle in there, which is to make sure that Nagorno-Karabakh is addressed, that the rights and securities are addressed. Obviously, that's something that has to be discussed between the people in Nagorno-Karabakh and Baku as well. And I've underscored that there should be an international mechanism to do that. You're absolutely right, Senator, and as Senator Cardin said, uh, the Minsk group process uh, has, has not been functioning. Uh, the Minsk group mandate and its ideal remains relevant, and the goal of that is right, um, but I think it's uh, not important to, to focus on names and, and what we do with, uh, with the so-called Minsk group. The Russian colleague, for instance, has, has never been in touch with me. Uh, rather, let's do what we can working with the two sides, bilaterally, trilaterally, as the Secretary did, bringing them together here, working with the European Union, which has been really uh, remarkable in bringing the leaders together, because that's where the tough decisions are going to have to be made. Mm. After last week, they have pledged to 
get back with another round of discussion, uh, uh, ideas, uh, proposed uh, development of a draft peace agreement, and the foreign ministers to meet again. I expect the leaders will, will meet again. So the progress is drip, 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 as, as we know, but it's really quite remarkable what I've seen just in, in less than three months in this capacity. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks, Thank you. Senator Booker. Senator, I'm glad you, you raised that because uh, we talked about the region, the South Caucasus being a, a geographic crossroads. It's really where history and geography meet uh, at a crossroads. And, and at this moment in history, you are seeing this unique situation where Russia, which cannot be excluded from the broad equation, geography tells you that and, and history tells you that, uh, they play a role, they've been involved, uh, but obviously the impact of their actions against Ukraine has, has made an impression on Azerbaijan as well as Armenia and certainly Georgia, which as we mentioned earlier, is still 20% occupied. Uh, their, their land is occupied um, and we underscore every day our uh, strong support for Georgia's full territorial integrity and, and uh, sovereignty and, and uh, independence. Um, I think it's an area where both Armenia and Azerbaijan are actually seeing they have mutual concerns. Uh, we are not a part of, uh, nor were we involved in the actual peace agreement, the ceasefire, to put it more correctly, that was reached with the Russians, a tripartite agreement, they called it, in November 2020. Uh, we welcomed the end of, of hostilities. But that included peacekeepers uh, in those regions. Now, we've seen with the violence in, in September, uh, that those peacekeepers were in many ways nowhere to be seen. Um, and I think that's been a question of concern uh, for both sides. A comprehensive settlement. Do you link that to the fact that they're I, I can't make that link myself uh, as an, an analyst, but I think one could see that even when Putin <clears throat> sent peacekeepers there in 2020, we know now that he obviously had other plans for his troops. Uh, in mind, and uh, the responsibilities he took on in the South Caucasus in Nagorno-Karabakh along the Armenian-Azerbaijani border um, obviously uh, are affected by that. As mentioned, I, I lead our delegation to the Geneva International Discussions, which focus uh, on the issue of, of Russia's occupation of uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, which are integral part of, parts of Georgia. Um, Russia made a lot of commitments under the 2008 ceasefire agreement, and they have not lived up to those commitments. Uh, they committed to withdraw their forces. Uh, we know that they uh, interfere uh, in, uh, in, in politics. We've seen it, of course, in our own country. Um, they have pledged to allow unfettered access, for instance, for delivery of humanitarian assistance into Abkhazia and South Ossetia. They have not done that. Uh, so this is a challenge for, for Georgia. The uh, Geneva International Discussions did hold a session in October, and the Russians did show up. They were able to uh, get themselves to uh, Geneva for that. Um, and the Georgians, I think, were pleased that we could show that we continue to stand by that process. If I, if I can interrupt, I'd like to get one more uh, question. Uh, my team and I have been looking a lot at the food and security issues um, as it relates to the conflict in Ukraine. Obviously, Georgia is an area where we have endangered ancient roots species that have really been undermined by 
uh, the Russian influence. And I'm wondering uh, how is the ability to build c uh, capacity for wheat production uh, in, in Georgia as it, looks, as it sort of relates to our ability to deal with the ongoing crisis? Um, and are we involved in a deeper effort to try to promote that domestic wheat production? So I cannot go deep on this, but I can tell you that Carrie Fowler, who is the food envoy at the State Department, is incredibly knowledgeable on this, and I know is doing a lot of work on it. So we certainly can circle back and get you more information on that. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Senator Markey takes his seat. It's uh, his uh, turn. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, <clears throat> September, I sent a letter with my colleagues to Secretaries Blinken and Austin asking them to prevent any U.S. security assistance from going to Azerbaijan until Armenia and Azerbaijan reached a permanent, lasting resolution to ensure peace and stability uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh. We also requested answers to several questions that I have not yet received answers to, so I will pose them uh, to you now. One, is the U.S. government currently providing any security assistance to Azerbaijan? Can you just speak up just a little? I'm sorry. Apologies. So, as you referenced, in June of this year, we did decide to extend the waiver of Section 907 of the Freedom Support Act. And so we are providing assistance to Azerbaijan through that mechanism. And what is that assistance? So that assistance goes to several things. It strengthens interoperability among the U.S., NATO, and Azerbaijani peacekeeping forces. It increases the Western education and orientation of Azerbaijani officers. It helps secure Azerbaijan's 475-mile border with Iran. And it provides security for energy sources critical for our allies in Europe. And so what are those energy resources? So that would be, and actually we've seen an increase of Azerbaijani oil and gas flowing to Europe as they diversify away from Russia. Okay, and that, and that waiver was granted when? In June. In June. Has the U.S. government taken steps to assess whether any Azerbaijani units who currently receive or have received in the past U.S. security assistance engaged in recent fighting against Armenia? Yes. Uh, First, I just want to emphasize there's nothing automatic about this waiver, so we assess it every year. We benefited from the GAO review of the Section 907 waiver process and have implemented those recommendations, and all of our assistance is carefully calibrated to make sure it doesn't undermine or hamper efforts to negotiate a peaceful settlement between Armenia and Azerbaijan and to ensure that any assistance we provide cannot be used for offensive purposes against Armenia. And you have established that? Yes, as we a have. Fact. Yes. Uh, Ambassador Rika, do you believe that Russia's influence in the region and in Armenia in particular is waning? And what should the United States do to capitalize on any opportunities to increase our own presence and influence in the region? Thanks for that question, Senator, because uh, I do think uh, Russia's actions uh, in Ukraine, <clears throat> the attack there, have, have made publics, let alone governments, uh, across the South Caucasus more wary of Russia, Putin's intentions. Um, the Russian engagement uh, in Armenia has not helped the Armenians and their cause, uh, and I think uh, they questioned that, and we see that again uh, at public levels uh, as well. Uh, I think what we want to do is underscore our dedication to working with the countries bilaterally and, and uh, in multilateral fora 
to promote this lasting peace because I think there's a realization that while Russia remains part of the geographic equation, uh, that it's the, the two countries coming to a full peace agreement, uh, an end of violence, and then also with Georgia working to create synergies across that critical South Caucasus between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea where you have energy resources, you have infrastructure opportunities, you have great trade opportunities, you have agriculture opportunities. This can be uh, a food basket uh, for much of the world. Tourism, these are all things that they can do once they have achieved this comprehensive peace. And I think both leaders at this moment see that there's an opportunity for a whole new chapter in history there. So do, do you, have you concluded that Russia's influence is waning in Armenia? I think it's something you have to watch very closely. I don't like uh, leaping to any conclusions. The Russians uh, remain active. They have historic ties. Uh, the CSTO uh, remains uh, a structure which has uh, not lived up to Armenia's expectations as a member of that. Um, they remain active diplomatically. Uh, Putin hosted the two leaders in Sochi uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, we want to encourage the leaders to get together and make their own decisions. I think it's important that our embassies are, are robust. They need to be led by ambassadors there on the ground to increase the engagement that we can do. And uh, in my capacity, I travel regularly. I'll be going again in another week uh, to the region to continue to show what the U.S. wants and how we can support their efforts. And in your view, what can a peace agreement between Azerbaijan and Armenia do to fully guarantee the rights and security of the Armenian people in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh? I think that's, that's really the heart of, of a question uh, that we have to, to pay attention to. Uh, that is where Prime Minister Pashinyan has been very clear that it's not about territory, it's about security and about rights. And President Aliyev has acknowledged that uh, publicly and in conversations I've had with him and other colleagues have had with him. Uh, that's important and to do that fully, as I mentioned in my testimony and as I stress every day, they need to consider uh, how they can engage a, a, a mechanism, an international uh, <coughs> effort to support, to monitor, uh, to offer help and it can have an economic component and capacity as well to make sure that those people have an opportunity to define what security and rights means and to see that that is implemented. It takes time, but we are at a crucial moment where I think there's a, a new and unique opportunity to try to get that right. Okay, great. And uh, Secretary Dunfrey, just finally, um, in your earlier testimony, you stated that the State Department has taken steps to implement the GAO recommendations before extending the 907 waiver for Azerbaijan assistance. Uh, can you please explain in more detail the steps that were taken? So thank you, Senator. So the State Department requested and received input from agencies about all ongoing assistance programs, the potential impact of those programs on the peace process, and the implementing agencies and partners' assessments of potential applicability of the Section 907 waiver prior to recommending renewal of the waiver this year. The State Department then completed an assessment as to whether any of these programs had an impact or could have an impact on the negotiations between Armenia and Azerbaijan. This assessment was transmitted to Congress as part of the June 2022 waiver determination. And then in the follow-on 60-day report, the State Department and the Department of Defense evaluated each ongoing assistance program to ensure there was no impact on either the military balance or on peace negotiations between the two countries. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, uh, let me just say as we come to a close here, um, I will charitably say that this is one of the most disappointing hearings I've ever heard, uh, I've ever held. Uh, but it has crystallized some things for me. One is it seems to me that the United States is in bed with Azerbaijan. Assistant Secretary Dunfrey, you said we urge Azerbaijan to observe human rights, yet we give it money, and they continue to do what they want. Money is fungible. 
And so whether it is direct assistance that can hurt Armenia or not, money is fungible. They're not using that money. Uh, they would have to use other money that they have for other things that we give them money for. I heard you say that in response to, I think it was Senator Markey's question, we, what we were urging them to do is to stop the violence, but you have to recognize when there's an aggressor. If I'm the recipient of the violence and you're urging both sides to stop the violence, but it's one side that's the aggressor, you should direct your comments to the aggressor. We seem incapable of doing that. We've done nothing to verify the videos and the evidence of cluster munitions, of white phosphorus, of, which are illegal. Uh, we have done nothing to verify the videos of the execution of Armenian soldiers, uh, the abuse of female Armenian soldiers. We've done nothing. I ask you, are you aware of the videos? Yes. Well, did we do anything to verify them? No. And you come to a hearing in which you can't even tell me with any degree of specificity what humanitarian assistance we're providing. So it's totally, totally unacceptable. And you can tell the secretary I'll be looking for ways to express my dissatisfaction. Let me conclude by asking unanimous consent uh, to have uh, Ranking Member Risch's opening statement included in the record as at the opening of the hearing without objection so ordered. And unanimous consent that the testimony, quote, the Armenian American community and U.S. policy priorities in the Caucasus submitted by the Armenian National Committee of America be entered into the record without objection. It shall also be submitted. With that, the record for this hearing will remain open until the close of business on Thursday, November the 17th. Please ensure that questions for the record are submitted no later than Thursday, uh, and this hearing is adjourned.